All right, uh, some disclosures. So, I don't know if you guys can see this one. Uh, this is a little bit like uh, what the things have been like uh, in general in the past. You see, mm. especially taking complex situations and trying to make things simple. Um, and uh, the reality is, she's not very really good at that. And so, uh, instead of making simple solutions, we try to come up with more complex ones. Um, and you can see the example of what that was looking at. Um, and so hopefully we'll simplify these problems and try to align it a little bit better than, than that. So uh, we know that um, sagittal balance clinically can be quite disabling. It can lead to early fatigue, um, uh, pain, uh, poor cosmesis. Uh, I got this from Dr. Bagri's mom. Um, can lead to some functional limitations um, as well and of course, mechanical back pain. Uh, but neurologic symptoms can also um, be present uh, from, from uh, pressure on the neurologic structures, as we know. Um, and all of this uh, really came to a head um, uh, with, the, with a, a, a study group uh, where Dr. Bridwell and, and his associates, in, including um, um, Dr. Glassman, ended up having um, the ability to look at a lot of adult deformity patients um, as it relates to their sagittal alignment. And so um, uh, what they end up coming up with is actually realizing that um, a positive sagittal balance is most highly correlated with adverse health outcomes and that lumbar kyphosis did much worse than those that had a normal lumbar lordosis. So that was sort of like the, the first landmark articles uh, that really got into our literature and uh, uh, drawing us to pay attention to the sagittal plane. Now, the guys at UCSF have done a great job of helping us understand this as well. Um, so that what we're seeing here is just the effect of having this normal cone of economy, and that's where most of us um, uh, strive to exist. And sagittal balance really happens when you go outside that cone of economy, and the result is that there's increased strain on the lumbar musculature, um, increased strain on the on the the bones uh, and the spinal pelvic area and the discs um, and the joints and the result is a higher caloric requirement for just existing daily as well as pain that um, result as a pain that then comes as a result. So the ISSG uh, then was able to build off of this, um, and uh, uh, this group, the ISSG group, really started in about 2008. Um, we did a lot of retrospective work at first, and it wasn't until sort of the early 2010s that we were able to look at some prospective data. And once we had that, we start, were able to start to really define the effect of um, adult spinal deformity relative to other disease states. And so. This is basically um, just looking at the SF36 scores um, and looking at other disease states that, um, that we know about uh, from these reference values that are well documented. But you can see that ASD patients in general perform on a similar um, level with other chronic diseases like cancer, diabetes, heart disease, rheumatoid arthritis, um, and being you know, numerous MCIDs below the general or healthy population. So, in other words, adult spinal deformity can be, when it's symptomatic, a more debilitating condition. Um, further then looked at this by um, uh, who ends up being a good operative candidate, and uh, ultimately it basically said patients that are, um, have um, higher disability are really the ones that should be amenable to um, operative intervention. So, it ended up not being so much about the x-ray and definitely more about the disability that ensues. Um, we then wanted to see what the impact was of uh, ASD um, in comparison to other um, uh, disease states. And one of the reasons to do this really was to raise the issue on the medical level that this is something that ought to be picked up by even primary care docs. And so what we end up doing is just taking um, the PCS scores and MCS scores of the SF36 and really trying to um, compare them to other norms that are out there um, and um, comparing them not only to um, other disease states but in one sense also uh, to, our, uh, to our own disease states. And again, you can just see how uh, uh, the performance of these ASD patients is much more like other chronic disease states. Um, 
So we know that ASD has a substantial disease impact, um, and uh, these values, again, uh, show us that uh, patients that have uh, these types of problems, the ASD problems, um, basically have um, uh, exist in a place where they're um, uh, substantially functionally uh, limited. Um, uh, there are uh, also comparisons back to our own specialty, like back pain and sciatica, and found that we're worse than those, or worse than patients with chronic hypertension, and then once again, some of those with other chronic disease states. So we, we needed to further look and investigate this because we all know that, AS, that adult spinal deformity covers a really broad range of, of, of patients, and it's probably unfair to say a 22-year-old with a 55-degree curve is the same as a 70-year-old with a severe sagittal coronal malalignment. And so this is where we started looking at this in a little bit more detail and substratified patients based off of their um, different diagnoses and saying, all right, if you look all the way on the left on this graph, you have, you know, what adult, what adult spinal deformity is in total. But then as you look further and further to the right, you'll see that uh, we're looking at patients as they go from this state, which is, you know, uh, um, a girl in her 20s that has a progressive uh, deformity is going to be different than someone on um, uh, further down the phase. And this is someone here that's in their 60s with a coronal plane deformity without a sagittal plane deformity. Um, and then we see that that actually gets worse as the patients uh, have a worsening sagittal plane. So the all the way on the right are patients that have a substantial coronal deformity um, as well as having um, substantial uh, sagittal plane deformity. So the difference of those two points in the graph would be someone that's able to maintain their cone of economy versus someone that cannot. So um, if we look at these more specifically, you can see that again, this is, as zooming in on that last graph, just, uh, just showing you guys um, um, what the PCS values are here for uh, patients that have um, uh, different disease types that would correlate to. So um, say someone that has, you know, pretty severe back pain from their thoracic deformity is more like someone that has chronic, a little bit more like chronic issues like diabetes or, uh, or cancer. Um, if you go further down the list to someone that has an SVA, say greater than five, um, it's a little bit more like someone that has osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. And as you get all the way to the right side of the curve, um, you'll notice that um, we're comparing, we don't really have a comparison group of what's been documented. So. Patients with severe sagittal and coronal plane malalignment, there's actually not a disease state document that's as severe as that. Um, and if you look at one, one level up there on the second curve to the, from the right, uh, these are patients that are similar to those that actually have a bilateral, uh, amp better bilateral amputees. So functionally, it can be extraordinarily limiting for these, uh, for these individuals. So we know adult deformity is actually pretty darn common though, right? So we also know that not everyone with these deformities is walking around um, like a cripple, but we do know that it can happen. Now. So it's important that we differentiate those that are symptomatic from those that are maybe not as symptomatic. Um, we also know that there's very important um, compensatory mechanisms in play that allow patients to maintain their function, including pelvic retroversion, um, changing their lordosis as long as it's flexible, um, uh, the posterior pelvic shift and, and knee flexion and hip flexion. So we're going to run through these pretty quick, as most of us are, are fairly aware of them. Um, and uh, but I wanted to kind of give a little bit of historic uh, uh, credence to them. Uh, lumbar lordosis, as we know, um, is really important, and we know as, as the flatter the the lumbar spine gets, uh, the the worse uh, their functional outcomes are, and this is as it relates to numerous different parameters. And this graph here just in particular looks at ODI as the, as the result. Pelvic incidence is a morphologic parameter. We're actually studying this a little bit more now and feel that perhaps it's not quite as dogmatic as saying that it never changes. Um, but in general, the PI is like the constant. Um, it's not really affected by patient position and there's no real variation in time in the adult population. So it's a point drawn from the middle of the thermal heads to the middle of the sacrum and then uh, that angle is measured then towards a, a 90 degree angle from the S1 end plate. And you can see that if, if you change the, the, the position of the pelvis, um, it, the PI does not change. And that's the basic concept there may, we may be finding some slight variabilities after correction in these patients, um, uh, but we're not talking major changes unless um, osteotomies are happening really low. Uh, this is me in Brazil and realizing that there are morphologic um, 
differences in different uh, in different cultures. The Brazilians like that one. So the relationship between uh, the pelvic incidence and lumbar lordosis has been one of the hallmarks of what we um, of what we've been studying. Uh, we know that a large PI um, is going to reciprocally require a larger lordosis to make up for the sagittal plane, and a small PI um, will require um, less lordosis. And this gets uh, even on to the concept of uh, Dr. Russo Lee and his uh, different pelvic shapes and finding where the apex of the lumbar lordosis is. And the higher the PI is, the higher the apex in the lumbar spine. Um, and the lower the PI is, the lower that apex is. Um, to simplify all that, um, uh, Virginie Lafage and the group out of New York and, and the ISSG have actually, there's actually this equation to figure this ideal relationship out is actually pretty darn long. But when, you, when it comes down to it, it really is uh, uh, something that can very pragmatically be put into an equation where the lumbar lordosis should equal the pelvic incidence, um, basically plus or minus 10 degrees. So it kind of gives you a framework to achieve your goals. And so, again, uh, the UCSF group put some really cool videos together to help us understand this. Patients with a low pelvic incidence don't require a huge uh, lordosis to accommodate it, but as you increase the pelvic incidence, in order for the, the spine to just normally um, maintain a, a, a cone of economy like we talked about early, you have to have uh, more uh, lordosis present. The pelvic tilt, uh, uh, um, uh, on the other hand, is um, something different, and is, uh, it's a compensatory mechanism. And, to measure this, it's the midpoint of the sacrum to the middle of the femoral heads, and then a line vertical to that from the femoral heads. And the angle created there is called the pelvic tilt. The tilt is positional, so it's a compensatory mechanism as it relates to a vertical line. So as the pelvis shifts posteriorly, you're going to see that angle. Um, uh, say as the pelvis retrofits, you'll see that angle increase. And that compensatory mechanism, again, as the patients become more sagittally malaligned, you know, as they're as they're head goes more forward, you can increase the pelvic tilt um, as a compensatory mechanism to maintain horizontal gaze and to maintain um, uh, the cone of economy. Um, we also know that increases in pelvic tilt do lead to um, uh, more severe uh, disability from uh, ODI, SF12, and SRS22. So um, moving on here, as we look at these advanced disease uh, um, states, uh, actually, when we compensate, it actually requires a larger amount of energy expenditure. So um, as you have to retrovert your pelvis, the efficiency of the muscles that are being used actually goes down, and you have to engage both neck, pelvic, and low lumbar muscles in order to, to exist, and that becomes um, a problematic. So... <clears throat> um, the increased energy expenditure obviously then results in increased pain. And um, there comes a point in this disease state where uh, even uh, regular compensatory mechanisms aren't enough, and so patients have to flex their um, hips and their knees in order to be able to get their upright posture. And these states, even bringing a walker or canes or things like that, actually can be quite helpful because it offloads um, the back. And that's where you'll see patients just becoming more and more uh, dysfunctional uh, on this scale of, of disability. So the SVA um, is basically uh, the central vertical axis going from a C7, um, the center of the C7, and dropping a plumb line down, and as it relates to the posterior superior um, uh, S1. And that number should be less than five centimeters um, to maintain that kind of economy. So uh, we measure, again, this in the C7 centroid. It's a straight plumb line down, and you measure as it relates to the posterior superior of S1, and that gives you that distance right there. It gives you your, your SVA. So these are sort of the basic parameters that we follow. The SVA should be less than 5, the tilt less than 20, and the PI should be proportional, so within 10 degrees. Um, so, uh, uh, again, here showing this um, this. A uh, cartoon of all the different compensatory mechanisms that exist um, and the different muscle fatigues that uh, ensue as it really ends up engaging everything uh, posteriorly. And you can see that realigning these patients and getting them back into a, a reasonable cone of economy is kind of what the concept is behind the reconstructive or realignment procedures to, to help in all this. So, 
Um, we do have to realize, and we won't touch on it too much today, though, that doing a lot of work in the lumbar spine can ultimately result in reciprocal changes in the thoracic spine that can be either wanted or unwanted. Um, and uh, ideally, I'm sure that we would all uh, end up with an awesome result, but the, the reality is we have a little bit of a more difficult time uh, truly understanding these reciprocal changes that um, and these adjustments that the body goes through because I believe they're uh, very individualistic. Um, just a little break from the lecture. Uh, you know, like I was saying, I w wish we were act uh, active in everything we do, kind of like these guys uh, here. On a, hopefully this video is pulling through. But, uh, you know, if, if life was this predictable um, and we could we could be on the money every time, it would be awesome. But, uh, uh, unfortunately, it's not quite that way. So um, just a, an interesting uh, a case here. This is a patient that came to us. She was a recurrent anterior dislocator. Uh, she'd had seven or eight dislocations uh, prior to our visit. Um, she ended up, she actually had a posterior approach um, to have this placed, um, but uh, you can see how the, the cup was placed in um, not a very good position, and uh, she um, continually dislocated. When you zoom now, um, she ended up having a long um, uh, uh, posterior fusion many years ago um, and had a fairly stiff lumbar spine with a pretty substantial uh, sagittal plane deformity. Um, her pelvic incidence, um, uh, as we measure here, um, uh, lumbar lordosis, as you can see, we measure here, and then the pelvic tilt, just kind of like we talked through. Um, and the SVA um, on her end up being a pretty uh, significant um, and when you put it all together, she had a trunkal shift. She had um, a pretty high SVA. Her tilt was maximized. And she had a very significant uh, mismatch between lumbar lordosis and uh, her pelvic incidence. Uh, so this would be one of those patients that falls on the right side of that graph uh, that we saw earlier of uh, having a severe sagittal plane deformity. Uh, this is what uh, um, we did for her, um, hooking her up and kind of restoring her overall alignment. And interestingly, she... Uh, stopped the dislocating. Um, similarly, uh, here is a patient um, with, um, uh, and this mainly showing, this is using surgeon map. Um, this is a video taken in real time. Uh, you know, thankfully, the, um, the group that designed this, um, the Maris, has made this really very simple for everyone to be able to do. So the way their software works out is basically, you know, you draw, um, six things, you draw each femoral head, and then you draw a line, the S1 end plate, the L1 end plate, the T2 end plate, and the, the L, uh, C2 inter end plate. And it basically ends up calculating everything for you. You can do additional measurements, like here I'm measuring what's called a thoracic pelvic angle um, to help me understand um, sort of my intraoperative um, needs as well. Um, but the reason I wanted to show uh, you guys this is it really is pretty darn easy to do. Um, I think that may be a 30 second video or so. So when um, folks tell me, I, I just don't have the time in clinic to measure things out. The reality is if you have search map loaded up, it's, it's a screenshot and those few clicks away from getting it measured out. So it actually ends up being pretty easy and it gives you a, a good sense of what's going on. Uh, this patient ended up having a uh, non-union at L3-4 with uh, uh, focal kyphosis there in addition to having a flat back from his previous uh, PLFs, and so we did uh, um, sort of a hybrid MIS and open uh, reconstruction on him where we did an ACR plus a PSO and got him uh, lined back up to where he needed to be. So this is um, a 77-year-old male. Uh, several of you guys have seen this already. It's a, um, a gentleman that failed on operative management um, uh, from having a, a previous sagittal plane deformity fixed in uh, some lumbar kyphosis. Um, and uh, uh, here he is uh, mapped out. And the reason I'm showing this case, I kind of want to show you how I think through these problems. So here's a patient um, that you can see the, his parameters as noted below. When you adjust his pelvic tilt and make it to something that would make it more normal, so around 20 degrees, you can see that his overall sagittal imbalance actually is worse than, um, than uh, he actually presents with. And, on him, I, thought, I felt an L3 PSO would be most predictable. However, he was um, not interested in that. Um, he wanted uh, an anterior column realignment. He's a spine surgeon from uh, out of state, and uh, he was not interested in, in, a, in a PSO. So we said, well, 
you know, if we did a two-level ACR, that may um, get us realigned in a reasonable way um, to get to reconstruct, and that's ended up what we'd end up doing was a two-level ACR, um, and uh, uh, same day um, reconstruction with uh, uh, T11 to LEM uh, extension of diffusion. Um, here he is two years post-op um, and uh, doing quite well. Um, so it's always important to um, be able to assess um, what you're doing in the operating room. Um, and this is an important slide because we see planned versus what actually happened. Um, uh, so we actually planned for a little bit more correction than what we actually got. But I think ultimately uh, the a sort of harmonious correction that we ended up getting out of his spine ended up being uh, even more favorable. So um, uh, thankfully he, he worked out. Um, so this is a uh, 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 another case example, just kind of looking uh, through this uh, same planning and how we use these parameters and put them into action. 72-year-old female with fatigue in her legs, so walking gears in two blocks, has low back pain, can't stand upright. Uh, she, the more she walks, uh, the more she leans forward. So this is something that we actually see quite uh, often is this dynamic nature to the sagittal now alignment. They'll stand up and you'll see them standing in clinic when you evaluate them with their knees and their hips straight. And they don't look horrible. They definitely look a little bit forward. But then when you ask them about how they feel when they ambulate, you'll see that they're, they can tolerate a certain time is what typically is what I hear. I can, I can go five or 10 minutes standing upright um, but like anything beyond that, I just feel like I, ha I, I lose it. I, I, I lean more and more forward or, you know, to the right or left or what it ends up being. And that's that dynamic nature to the sagittal uh, malalignment. Um, she's had uh, many numerous surgeries in the last five years, something we hear uh, quite commonly. And so here she is, not much of a coronal offset, a little bit um, off to the right. And sagittally, when you look at her, you may not think there's much going on here, but if you uh, uh, take into account um, her pelvic shape and the ideal for where she should be, I'll show you uh, where she's actually at. So she's had a fusion up to L2. There's air in the disc space at uh, L12, which is a good sign uh, from a reconstructive standpoint, uh, but also tells us that there's probably abnormal motion going on there. Um, if you look at her facet joints between L1 and L2, and L2 she actually had a, a breach of her um, L1 uh, pars, um, likely because of her um, desire to um, extend. So um, this is where she, um, uh, so we'll look at her fusion mass, and she's got a solid fusion mass all the way down. I have a little bit of a stenosis up at L1-2, but um, really, really not that, probably not that bad. And uh, her psoas anatomy is favorable uh, for an ACR, if that's something that uh, was um, part of the planning uh, process. So here's her alignment, um, and then what I would do with her is actually correct her pelvic tilt. So just based on her um, story, what she was telling us, and I corrected her a little bit more aggressively down to about 15. And this is a point where we, you know, a lot of a lot of folks say, how do you know where to correct them to? And um, I, I oftentimes will um, do that based off of uh, the story that I hear from the patients as well as their pelvic shape, and she has a medium-sized pelvic incidence, but her story was one where she was having a difficult time compensating. So I, I, I thought that for her, perhaps, a pelvic tilt of 26 was more towards um, uh, getting towards her max of compensation rather than it being um, something that's uh, uh, normal. Because as we know, there's some folks that have a pelvic tilt of 26 that are actually um, uh, totally functional. So if we correct her to something like uh, 15 or, or so, you'll see that her SVA is actually substantially worse than where she is. And I bet this is probably more representative of what she's like when she's walking. So if we did like an L2, L1-2 ACR, um, you'll see that this is not, not great. This is not a harmonious correction. Um, and I think this ends up being uh, what we may have done historically, but likely represents a common point of failure. The reason I say that is because if you correct the, if you're trying to correct the pelvic tilt, which is what we assumed on that last slide when I corrected it, that you have to do that, doing that with an ACR above the L3-4 level really results in pretty poor, a pretty poor ability to actually treat that deformity. So what actually happens is this. So if you were to do an L1-2 ACR on her, you would actually probably just be shifting the proximal portion of her spine posteriorly 
And the result would actually be PJK rather than pelvic tilt correction. And we've seen this uh, clinically as well. So if you think of doing a smaller, say a, a small PSO at L3, you'll see that there is definitely a much more harmonious look to her spine. And this would probably be a better way to go. Um, on her, however, I, we did um, something a little bit different in that if you look here, you'll see that there is pretty significant segmental kyphosis at that level. And so in the operating room, we went um, and decided to neutralize that segment. So she had about 15 degrees of kyphosis just across that segment, even supine in the, uh, on the operating table. So after we did the, um, the lateral, we just decided to do a lateral inner body, but even with uh, just putting a 10 millimeter um, trial in there, she was not correcting at all. And so the decision was made at that point to try to get the correction anterior. And so a uh, little mini ACR was done in the sense that we released the ALL, but only put a smaller sized cage in there. And so this is what that looked like. And you can see now on the image on the right, if we zoom in, um, we got just about the 20 degrees out of it, got 18 degrees out of it. And, and, and I would say the idea of the concept here was neutralizing um, that segment to make it to zero so that we could uh, um, fix that segmental kyphosis, realizing all the while that we're not fixing her flat back. So the next thing we did here then was um, uh, call it just a little mini PSO in the sense that we did most of the correction through a small midline approach, uh, put the screws in through an uh, MIS fashion, and then uh, just using a, a sort of a mini midline approach to do the remainder of the work. Um, uh, and again, just an attempt to get a, um, a uh, 20 degree, and if not, maybe 15 to 20 degree uh, type of correction through that fused segment. So here's us that's doing that, just putting the temporary rods in, um, uh, doing the PSO, and then clamping it down. And that's what it looks like here. Um, and you can see we got the PSO is about 17 degrees. Um, the ACR plus the PSO was 25 and uh, felt that um, that was actually a little much. So we took a, we dialed a little bit out of that and we put our, um, our final construct in and then passed the rods again through percutaneous uh, phase. And then this is what she looks like afterwards. So you can see with the correction we were able to get, um, we got a nice harmonious uh, restoration. Her tilt ended up at right around 18. Um, which I think was good for her, her PIL within that 10 degree um, and the PSO angle was uh, 27 degrees. However, the PSO itself is only 17. So I think um, uh, I'll stop there. Um, we have, have more cases we can go through, but um, maybe leave a few minutes for discussion um, if, that, if that works. Am I, anybody there? We're here. Oh, okay. All right. I think, yeah, they're just probably needed. Greg? Yeah. Um, I, I just wonder if, if you make some comments on the ideal apex for the lordosis and if that changes with any other uh, factors of age or quality of bone or other things? Um, I, I know, just a general comment. Yeah, so there's a couple things. So it's a great comment. Um, uh, so it's several things go into that, right? So patients that have a higher pelvic incidence or require more lordosis, and typically in those patients, the apex of their lordosis goes more proximal. Uh, even up to L3 or even the L2-3 disc, depending on how how high that how high the the lordosis is. Um, the smaller the pelvic incidence, you know, those that are sub 40, the more um, the the more caudal that apex goes, likely down to the L3-4 or even L4 um, vertebral body. So it's important when you're reconstructing these patients and you're looking thinking about different inner body choices that you're also keeping in mind. So the ideal shape of the spine and that our goal is to recreate that ideal shape rather than just trying to match an angle. Um, I don't know how um, that concept relates to age 
I don't think the apex necessarily changes with age. I think the one of the concepts that's been toyed around in the academic circles is if um, uh, patients with advanced age don't need to be as sagely aligned as those um, uh, as of their younger counterparts, so to speak. And there seems to be two groups, uh, one group that believes this concept and the other group that thinks that's false. Um, uh, I, for one, probably err a little bit on the side of thinking that the cone of economy um, is the cone of economy. Uh, in other words, I don't think there's much of a, sh I don't think much of a shift happens with age. I think um, uh, perhaps the level of, a of activity of our aging population is not as demanding as the younger ones. And so um, maybe their sense of uh, global alignment, uh, the need to be in that kind of economy is not as uh, significant because they're not engaged in activities the same way the younger groups are. But I'll tell you from my practice, the older, less functional patients tolerate more imbalance than the older, very functional patients. So I think the more functional and active the individual, even at 80 or 85, uh, when they're imbalanced, especially post-op when their spine is stiff, they're, they're very unhappy.